today's scripture passage comes from 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Amen. 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 Thank you, Chelsea. Um, I remember this particular season of my life uh, where I was still in college, and it was before I really came to know Christ. It was, really bef- it was before I really came to know uh, the gospel, and uh, I was just attending the church because I grew up in the church. I was going on Sunday uh, to the church, and Christmas was quite a depressing season for me. Like, it was miserable, because... <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, because whenever I hear this theme of Christmas, you know, we, we went through these uh, themes of hope, peace, love, and today joy. It was speaking to my heart very loudly the lack that I had, the lack that I felt. You know, the lack of hope, the lack of peace, the lack of love, and lack of joy. You know, because I couldn't see any of those in, in my life. And the Christmas season was depressing because it just reminded me that, oh, I don't have peace, I don't have hope, and I don't have joy. And it was after I came to know Christ, it was after I came to really understand the gospel, I started seeing that joy, hope, and peace that, that Christ is really giving to me. And, and my encouragement to you, because I know some of us may go through this season like that. You feel like whenever we talk about these themes, like peace, hope, and then joy today, you may feel like, oh, you know what? I don't have it in my life. And my hope and encouragement is that as we look into the Word together today, that you will find it, and you will find God who is really, really giving it to you, and God who provided for you by his, his grace. And like I said, we're in the season of Advent. We just lit the candle uh, of joy, and we just sang a song. Uh, the first song that we sang today was a joy to the world. And joy, I believe, is one of the most important theme of Christmas, and it's a very important theme of Christian life. And it, it's been part of Christian tradition for a long time. You know, for example, the song that we sang, um, Joy to the World. It was written in 1719, a long time ago, by this famous uh, hymn writer, Isaac Watts, in, in, in England. And he was actually inspired to write this song uh, when he was reading uh, Psalm 98, where it speaks about you know, calling all the earth to make a joyful noise and sing a joyous sings. So this theme of joy, it's been part of the Christian tradition for a long time, like 17th century, 18th century in England. And before that, we remember, we know that in the book of Luke, it, the angels were um, telling this story of, of Jesus, and they were saying that this is the gospel of great joy. And the Psalms, there are full of songs and praises with like thanksgiving and then joyful noises so it's been part of christian um, tradition and and our passage today first john i think is very feeding for this season and is very feeding uh for the theme of joy and it's not a typical passage that tells the story of jesus being born but the passage teaches us the meaning and the significance of this season, the Advent and Christmas. And finally, and we'll see that it, it 
ultimately leads us to the joy that is found in the season of Advent. So as we look into our passage today, my prayer is that your joy will grow deeper and your joy be complete. And as we look into the, our word, uh, the scripture, I want to ask two questions as we reflect. Uh, the first question is, what is Advent for? No, I, I'll correct it. What is Advent is about? Because with this, we'll see the message of Advent, the message of Christmas. And the second question that we want to ask is, what is Advent for? The, there we find two purposes of Advent, the two purposes of Christmas. So the first question, what is Advent about? What is the message of the Advent? And the answer is very sim- simple. It's, it's about the coming of Jesus Christ. It's about the coming of eternal life. So let us look at verse 1 and 2 again. Uh, Verse 1 and 2, I'll be reading it for us again. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. You know, it's a very odd sentence if you look at it. Grammatically, it's very, very ambiguous. And in fact, uh, we read the first two verses, verse 1 and 2. Uh, John even didn't get to the sub- main subject and main verb of his, his, his sentence. In its original language, the, this whole passage up to four is, is one sentence, and his, his subject and his verb is, coming, uh, is appearing in verse three, where he says, we proclaim to you. But in verse one and two, what he does, he's expressing and he's describing the object of, of his verb, the object of his proclamation, and that is Christ. And here we learn, I think, at least two aspects of Advent. And then John speaks um, about it so clearly and so loudly, and we cannot miss it. The first is the historical truth of the Advent. Advent means that Jesus comes, Jesus came historically. He was a man who came particular time and a place of history. He's not simply an idea, and he's not simply the spirit, but he was a man who was born and who lived in particular time and space of our history. You know, John speaks about this man, Christ, and what he has done. He's saying that he has heard. He has seen with his own eyes. And he looked upon, and he even touched with his hand. You know, he spent, he did life together with this man, Jesus. You know, by the time John was writing this letter, he was an old man. It's almost, he he was in his like 80s and and 90s. It's been almost 50 years since he he, he spent time together uh, with Christ. You know, it's been 50 years since he experienced all these things that we read like from the book of the Gospels. Yet he remembers this man, Jesus. He remembers his Lord, you know, the one who called him and the one who did life together for three years. It's like this, you know, since we are an um, expert community, um, there are a lot of people coming in and a lot of people leaving Korea. Uh, some of us do life together here like for a shorter amount of time, maybe one year, two years, and then three years. And it's like you, when you, like, it's like you, when you leave this country and 50 years later, it's like you're remembering some of us here that did life together at Gospel City. I know Pastor Joel left uh, the country uh, for a while ago, about a month ago. Uh, let's imagine that 
in 50 years in, you're just recalling your time in Korea, and you're saying that, you know what, there was a guy whose name was Joel, <laughs> and we did life together. You know what, he, he, he preached on Sunday, and he, he taught us the gospel. And imagine someone comes to you and starts saying that the Joel never existed. The man that you remember, it's actually, it's in your imagination. He, he, never, he never existed. And, and John is speaking to the people who are claiming like that. John is speaking to the people who are claiming that, you know what? Jesus was never ex- existed. I think he's, it's just fairy tale. I can't believe that he really, really existed. And then that's what John is doing here. He's saying Jesus was real. I know him, and I did life together with him. Historically, 50 years ago, in time and space, he was born into this family of carpenters. Historically, he was with me, and we did life together. And that's what John is saying. He's speaking about this historical truthfulness of advent of Christ. But not only that, if you look at these verses carefully, Jesus' coming was not merely historical, but it was oddly spiritual. You know, Jesus' coming was spiritual truth. Advent means not only Jesus came historically, but it means that he was coming from somewhere else. He's not from this world originally. He was not part of this creation. Yes, John heard, have seen with his own eyes. John even touched Christ with his own hands. Yet that's not how he starts this passage here. What is the first thing that he mentions? He starts verse 1 like this, that which was from the beginning. Now John's testimony is this. Jesus, whom he spent time together, Jesus that he remembers, he's not someone who exists. He's not someone from this creation, but he's someone who exists before this creation. He is eternal life. And that's what also verse 2, he's clearly saying that, like he was with the Father and he was made manifest to us. And that's what John is saying. Jesus, this man, it's not, it was not simply man. He was, he was more than a man. He was someone from the crea- uh, before the creation. And then John was so excited about this truth. And then he's still amazed by this truth. And it's utterly spiritual because it's not something you can recognize and accept just because you saw this man, Jesus. I know there are many miracles, there are many stories, many um, healings that have Jesus have done, but this kind of um, opinion, like Jesus saying that he's, he's from the beginning, like he is God, it's kind of message that cannot just merely observe or heard, but it's kind of message that needs to be claimed. It's kind of message that someone needs to proclaim. And that's the message that Jesus proclaimed about himself. Like in the book of John, we, know, we see that he's saying, I say to you, before Abraham, I was. And it's the message that John is proclaiming in this, through this letter. And it's the message that the Holy Spirit continues, teaches, and convicts every believer's heart. And that's what we believe in. That's what the Holy Spirit continues convicts in our own hearts. He's God who came to this world. So there are two aspects of Advent. Historically, historically it's true. Jesus was a fully man who was born in the city of Bethlehem, who grew up in the city of Nazareth in particular time, in particular space but also it's spiritually true. He was fully God. 
He was the second person of triune God who was sent by the Father to save and redeem the sinners. Now, it is important for us to understand this. You will see a lot of people who either cannot accept the the spiritual truthfulness of, of, um, of Jesus. People will say, you know what? I think I agree that man Jesus existed 2,000 years ago, but I cannot understand, I cannot agree that he was God. He was someone who was sent from outside of this creation. But there will be also people who are saying that, you know what? I really love what Jesus taught, the, the, the Jesus I find in the, in the Bible and his teaching but I cannot agree that he really, really existed 2,000 years ago. And for us, it's really important for us to understand both aspects and then because this is the foundation of Christian gospel. And this is actually foundation of Christian joy. And this is what I mean. In his book, um, Knowing God, J.I. Packer explains about the incarnation. Incarnation is a theological term of like God coming to uh, this world as, as a human form. There, you know, he says that um, for thoughtful people, it's, it's not easy to believe in the message of the gospel. You know, for example, um, atonement, meaning that like Christ died for the sin of all people. Many feel difficulties to believe that the death of one man, Jesus of Nazareth, who was executed by the Roman Empire, can put away a sin of the world. Thoughtful people will find a difficulty to really grasp this idea and agree. And how about um, like resurrection? People, thoughtful people, will find it difficult that this man who existed physically, who actually died and resurrected. How about a virgin birth, the story of Christmas? How can one possibly believe in a, such a mystery? Like biologically, it doesn't make sense. And not only that, all the miracles and healings. Because all those stories and the messages of the gospel, without grasping uh, this truth of incarnation, God coming to this world in the form of a human being, you cannot really, really understand and agree with it. This is what John uh, J.I. Packer um, said. I'll quote, read a quote from his book, uh, from Knowing God. This is the real stumbling block in Christianity. It is... Here, that Jews, Muslims, Unitarians, Jehovah's Witness, and many of those who feel the difficulties concerning the virgin birth, the miracles, the atonement, and the resurrection have come to grief. It is from misbelief, or at least inadequate belief, about the incarnation that difficulties at other points in the gospel story usually spring. But once the incarnation is grasped, as a reality, these other difficulties dissolve. Like once we grant that Jesus was divine, it becomes unreasonable to find difficulty in any of this. It is all of peace and hangs together completely. The incarnation is in itself an unfathomable mystery, but it makes sense of everything else that the New Testament contains. What he says is this, you know, if you really grasp this historical and spiritual truth of the incarnation, all other parts of gospel will make sense. But without this, you know, you will end up seeking different gospel. If you really believe in it, you will find God who is not simply all powerful, all majestic, but God who is personally with you. You know, when you read the scripture, you will face God who knows you, who knows the pain, and who knows the temptation that you're going through, who's not simply telling you to achieve something, to work for something, but who invades into your life and does not give, give up on you. Now, we have one more important question to ask. 
we just talked, um, we asked this question about what is Advent about? And we're talking about the spiritual um, truthfulness and also historical truthfulness of the coming of Christ. But the question that I want to ask, I think it's an important question. What is Advent for? Here we want to talk about the purposes of Christmas. Because the other way I'm asking this question is this, like why? Why did eternal life, why did Christ chose to humble himself and come to the man, come to the humanity, took up on the form of humble men. Why? Because if you choose to leave your loved one, there must be good reason. If you choose to leave all the wealth and glory that you have, there must be the reason. Did he lack anything? No. He didn't do it because he need to get something did he need like something no he was not in need but what was his purpose of coming what is the purpose of advent and i think we find two beautiful purposes of christmas in our passage one is intimacy and the other one is joy and I, and I think this, these two are deeply connected to one another. First, intimacy. It's so clear. I want us to read verse 3 again. This, you know, like I said, John spent a few words of, to describe his object of this sentence in verse 1 and 2. And um, finally, in verse 3, he's saying his um, subject and, and verb. Verse 3 says that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The message that John and the other apostles proclaimed is what Jesus proclaimed. Because Jesus himself proclaimed with his words, with his life, and with his character, with like who he is about, about this message. What was it for? What is the whole season of Advent is about? Why Christ humbled himself? Why was he born in the form of man, form of weak baby 2,000 years ago? Like why did he go to the cross? So that he can invite each one of us to this intimate fellowship that he had from the beginning. You know, his coming, the coming of Christ wasn't just to give us a ticket to heaven. His coming wasn't just uh, simply to give us a good lesson or good value. But he took this journey of his mission so that whoever listens this message and whoever believes in him will be invited into this fellowship with his father and with himself so that we may have this intimate fellowship with living God. And, and my encouragement, encouragement for this church, for you and for myself is to receive this to receive this gift that God wants to give every day. The fellowship, the intimacy that he's inviting us to. And then this fellowship always comes together with the other purpose of Christmas, which is joy. As in verse 4, he's continuing saying like this, and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Like I said at the beginning, joy is a very famous theme of Christmas for both secular people and um, religious people who are Christians. Because, you know, with the long history of Christianity, in, especially in uh, Western culture, I think there is this, this sense of excitement and then joy uh, that was shared in, in society and in, in the culture. And even when you're not going to the church, because it became part of culture. 
But Christian joy is, is not simply this warm feeling of whether like family gathering. Joy is not simply a feeling of excitement. Joy is not even unreasonable, optimistic tendency that some people have. But Christian joy is, is this. Joy is very reasonable response to the reality of intimacy. It's a response to, response to our fellowship with the Father and the Son. It's like this. When you fall in love with someone and when you spend time together with that person, it is unreasonable to be miserable and sad. But it's a very reasonable thing to rejoice in it. It's a very reasonable thing to rejoice that relationship. So the heart of Christian joy is from that intimacy that you are invited into. You know, we delight in Him. We're satisfied by Him. We're in love with Him. And the coming of Christ was for this invitation to intimacy and joy. Now, some of us may wonder uh, why there is such a lack of joy in in our Christian journey. Because that's what I was struggling with. Even after I became a Christian, you know, my temperament is not really exciting. I I, I am not um, the person who is very excited. Uh, I'm very calm. And a long time, and even in this season, that's my question that I ask myself. Like, oh, like why there is a, such a lack of joy in, in my Christian journey? And for a long time, I, I thought um, the pain and suffering was the biggest reason or biggest hindrance that blocks my joy. In some sense, it's true. But at the same time, and as I just reflect on this passage today, I, I find, and you'll find yourself lacking joy even when life is fine. Even when things are going okay, when there is no crisis in your life, and your job is okay, your family is okay, and your life is just fine, you'll still find yourself empty and joyless because it's possible and why is it like that because the real hindrance to joy is not because um, we are like suppressed or um, by pain or suffering but real hindrance is because we're delighting in something else because we're constantly trying to satisfy ourselves with something else we're like a little boy and girl like who consumes sugar cookies, sugar cookies, like when mom is not there. So when your parents like coming back and trying to give you a good feast, you're, you're, you're full. You don't have that appetite anymore for the good things. You're not hungry and you don't want to eat anymore. We're like a fool, like me. Um, when I'm thirsty, I, I drink Coke. And... <laughs> Whenever my, my wife tells me that I need to drink water, I'm, I'm, conv- I'm trying to convince her that, you know what, Coke contains water. <laughs> and we're, we're like that. We're like that. We're trying to drink Coke. It tastes good. It feels like it quenches our thirst. But in reality, we're still dehydrated. We need real water. And then that's what it's like. We are... Um, we, we drink something else all the time. And, and we feel like it quenches our thirst and, and deep in our hearts, but we know that that's not something we can really feel our hearts. We need Christ. We need this fellowship. We need this intimacy. And that's what he wants to give to you and, and to his people. You know, Christmas and Advent is a story of, about Emmanuel, God with us. 
You know, it's the story about the one who was with the Father from the eternity, the life giver, and he was manifested, he was revealed, he was exposed among humanity. The king of universe was born in the manger. He was born into a young, poor carpenter's family. And he came to invite us to this fellowship to invite all who believes in him to this intimacy that he provides for his people. And he invites you to today even. I know we're going through the season of Advent, and I know some of us are reflecting on it, uh, meditate on it. And what he does is that he's inviting you to hear from him, to see him and touch him and experience him. And this is the journey of the joy that he calls you to participate. And this is the joy of Christ, joy of Christmas. It's dawning of the new kingdom. It's the pinnacle of God's story and also pinnacle of our own story. It's the good news of great joy for you and for me. So Gospel City, I encourage you to pray with this this week. Pray with this First John 1 to 4 that you may have this intimacy with him. You may see him, you may hear from him, and you may experience him and encounter him. Let's pray.